God has something big in mind for each and every one of you. Trust. It is a clue. If you destroy trust, relationship is gone. Before betraying trust in such a way, think of the long-lasting effect. God gives us things to use. And one day, we are going to give account of it. The theme of my message tonight is, please, take care of yourself. Can you say to your neighbor? And my text is drawn from Genesis chapter 30, from verse 1 to 24, and Genesis 35, verses 16 to 18. Life is said to be the force which keeps us kicking, moving, functioning physically, mentally, and spiritually. On the other hand, Death is the cessation of life. There is something called life insurance. A good life insurance policy will yield a good amount of money for those the deceased left behind as he or she goes to meet his or her maker. One of my sons told me he had taken life insurance because you can't predict life. And he said, Dad, it is so that if anything happens to me, my wife and the children will not suffer financially. At least they will have money. If time is not taken, the money that will be paid will even make them more comfortable than they are now that he's alive. But the insurance policy does not bring back the dead. So as far as life is concerned, there is no assurance of continuity from day to day and as long as you want it. Therefore, I'll be showing you how you can manage to make your life last a bit longer. But there is no assurance that if everybody here does what I'm saying, that everybody will live longer. You can do all the things, and yet God will take his final decision. Today, Nigerians are so big in taking supplements. I remember some years ago, we come for board meeting or committee meeting, and I see everybody carrying his own bottle of spl uh, splinter. <laughs> and <laughs> it became the in thing, and, and <laughs> when traveling, when traveling abroad, I don't know how many, I can't remember how many jars my wife carried. <laughs> and when I tested this thing, I said, well, so this is all, all to keep me alive, leave me. <laughs> leave me alone. Uh -huh. A few months ago, somebody sent me a WhatsApp message from a renowned doctor. And what were they prescribing? Popo leaf. Popo leaf. If you can squeeze it in water as you process odubu, bitter leaf, then you drink the water. Oh, it performs miracle to you. I said, wow, purple leaf, you spell it ordinarily, it is so repugnant. How can I squeeze this thing, all the water, and drink it just because I want to live longer? Then Moringa started raining, and my wife said, you need this thing. I said, okay, give me. And they started boiling, she started boiling Moringa and giving me but God was so gracious, each time I took it, it made me to punch. So, <laughs> so, I was freed from Moringa. Today, 
medical experts are preaching. Drink how many liters of water a day? Some say four, some say five, some say six. Well, nobody can dispute that. I am trying. I have improved in water drinking. Uh, my spiritual father was also doing something else, which they call juicing. He would buy carrots, broccoli, spinach, beetroots, and all these vegetables, use blender to blend it properly, put it in a sack, tie it properly, and squeeze out the juice, and you drink it that way. I'm sure it was very, very healthy stuff. Yeah, uh, my wife hasn't gotten around to doing that. A friend was telling her, please, 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 start juicing, start juicing. It helps. So Nigerians want to live longer. And uh, recently they are saying that when eating, don't drink ice water. Why? They say that ice water uh, freezes the oil and that it makes it to coat the intestine and, you know, all the things in there. But I can't drink ordinary water. This, this is my problem. Ordinary water tastes like poison to me. So I want to make a confession. I still drink ice water when eating. You see, these things are great. And if you sit down to think about them, you discover that they make a lot of sense. And I'm sure that if you observe these rules, it will help you to live longer. Children also have their own view about life and death. Children tend to believe that life is a right they have. And it is because of how young they are and how full of life they are. So they always attach death to old age. And so they look at death as the exclusive portion of we the older ones. When younger, one of my sons traveled with us for, I think, Christmas holiday, and he looked at my father and said, I'm very sorry for Papa. Papa will die soon. <laughs> well, according to his prophecy, Papa died soon. <laughs> but I, I want to say that um, there have also been instances where the dry wood, standing like tree, remained, and it was the green tree that fell. So children, if you are rejoicing that you are free from death, uh, I want to tell you, you may not be 100% correct. Uh, one of my sons do attend a particular church, and I do go preach to that church. And my son called me up. He said something awful happened last Sunday. Do you know so doctor? I said, yes. Issues church? Yes. He's the assistant pastor. I said, yes. The previous Sunday, the son, 12-year-old son, was in church. The following Sunday, he went to church, that's my son, and everything looked cold and quiet. And at some point, the bishop or the presiding pastor uh, called the assistant pastor, Dr. Susu please can you come up according to your request? And the pastor, assistant pastor came up, a medical doctor, and he was thanking the church for how wonderful they were because of his son that died just a few days before then. The son of a doctor, not so, is not a sickler, no problem, something happened, and of course, when, when you are a doctor, you do everything, but this boy died. My most senior grandson saw me counting money they are not used to seeing cash. They don't handle cash the way we handle it. But I had a couple of few thousands of pounds sterling. And I was counting it. This boy saw this and said, Grandpa, you have a lot of money. I said, Yes. Give me some of your money. I said, No. He said, Why? 
before I could answer, he said, you will soon die. Who will have all the money? I said yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said, yeah, Jaden. Um, yeah, I may be dying very soon. But when I die, your mom and her siblings will inherit whatever I leave behind. Children don't inherit. If you want me to give you money, you must earn it. This is why you need to go to school. Study very hard. When you get job, get your wife, get your own children, and start earning money, by then your own father will be old. When your father dies, you inherit your father's son. <laughs> he was about six to seven years then. Then he turned nine. He turned nine, and my wife called. Jaden, congratulations. Yes, Grandma, but I'm very, very sad. Why are you sad? Yeah, very soon I'll be 100 and I'll die. <laughs> All the thing about we old ones is we are dying. Then my most senior granddaughter saw me with beautiful red, very small. I don't like carrying bulky things. I don't. In the days of carrying Bible, I don't like big Bibles. I don't like anything big. I like handy things. So, I told Reverend Adegoye, buy me the tiniest laptop. And when it came, the color was red. And this my granddaughter, the oldest one, saw me using it. Grandpa, can I have this laptop when you die? <laughs> I said, yes, you can have it. <laughs> so, all the thing is, I am dying soon. I'm going to die soon. That's all the thing. But the way we human beings look at death is not the way God looks at death. God does not see death as a bad thing. And it does not matter to God how long you live. It is true he has promised us old age. How many years did his own son live? About 33 and a half years. What of John the Baptist? How old did he live? About 33 and a half years because he was about six months older than Jesus Christ. What matters to God is the purpose for which he brought you here. And again, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, we are told, God gives us all things to enjoy. God does what? He gives us all things to enjoy. So life is one of the things God has given to us to enjoy. So the second thing that matters when it comes to life and death is how much of your life did you enjoy while this life remained? In our text today, we find the account of Rachel... Jacob's wife, from the beginning of her marriage and until death, she was fighting about two things. One, she was fighting to keep their husband to herself alone. Number two, she was fighting to have as many children as possible. On arrival to Padan Aram, Jacob went to the well. He was still asking questions about Bethuel, about Laban, about this and that. And all of a sudden they said, look, look at the daughter of Bethuel coming. Lo and behold, it was Rachel. And Jacob felt so overwhelmed that as he looked at Rachel, Standing before him, he grabbed her and kissed her. And he started crying. Have you read it before? He started crying. 
Men try to show that they are strong, more especially in the presence of women. Not to talk of a woman you think you are, will become your wife someday. You, you don't cry. But Jacob was so overwhelmed that when he saw Rachel, he kissed her and he started to cry. Jacob ran away from the family because the brother Esau said, I will kill you. I tried to make little research. I told him the way to help me. He's better in these things. And he said that it took about 100, sorry, it took about a month for him to trek from Padan Aram, uh, from Canaan to Padan Aram. He could have been kidnapped on the way and sold into slavery. A wild animal could have devoured him on the way. So getting to Padan Aram and standing on the soil of Padan Aram was a great thing to him. From childhood, Jacob heard about Padan Aram and Uncle Laban, and of late, his mom, Rebecca, was talking about Laban and his daughters in connection with marriage. After many days of trekking, Jacob saw himself standing on the soil of Padan Aram. Not only that, look at Rachel, one of the daughters of Laban, standing before him. It was like being in a dreamland. It was unbelievable. And as he took a gaze on Rachel, he discovered the girl was beautiful. She was stunning. That's why he grabbed her, kissed her, and cried, and cried, and kissed. Hallelujah. It is good to be proper, to carry yourself in a dignifying way. But from time to time, it is good to let go. Allow emotions to spill out. Hallelujah. You are a human being too. I'm sorry for anybody who doesn't cry. I thank God that um, God blessed me with enough, enough of it. <laughs> from the time Jacob set his eyes on Rachel, the chemistry that was between them never went. It never wore out. I believe on a later date, he cornered Rachel to a corner, to a, a place. And he must have asked, Rachel, will you marry me? Maybe he added, baby, I am, I am 77 years of age now and you are only about 25 years of age, would you please mind, or wouldn't you mind accepting this old man as your husband? The answer was surprising to him. It was a convincing yes. But Rachel, why do you want to marry a man that is many, many times older than you. How many people are here tonight and we are not married? Can you please stand? Now, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If you hope that one day you are going to get married, please keep this at the back of your mind. There must be something you have to ignore concerning the other person. What did I say? There must be something you have to ignore concerning this person. You can sit down. You cannot find everything you want in one person. It is impossible. So Rachel decided to overlook the age of this man called Jacob. What was Rachel's attraction? The family Jacob came from. There are some families you cannot say no to. Jacob came from Abraham's family. Abraham and Nahor were brothers. Bethuel was the youngest son of Nahor, the brother of Abraham. 
So Abraham was Bethuel's uncle. This Bethuel was Laban's and Rebekah's father. So Laban and Rebekah were the children of Abraham's nephew. So when you look at it, it was the same. The water boiling in the pot came from the same source. Hallelujah. Like Jacob, Rachel must have also been hearing about Uncle Abraham, great uncle Abraham, and Auntie Rebecca, who at different times left Padan Aram and traveled to Canaan. And there is no clue, there is, there is nothing for us to believe that Abraham again visited Padan Aram until he died. And neither did Rebecca visit Padan Aram again. Transportation and communication have greatly improved. Now we live in a global village. In the days of Rebecca, it was not so. So the two nuclear families, the family of Laban and the family of the sister Rebecca, who left to Canaan, they were living in two separate walls. Walls apart. I don't believe that letter writing was in vogue then. Abraham and Rebecca, who left, never came back, perhaps no communication whatsoever. So Rebecca was only listening to history. We had a great uncle called Abraham. He left us here, went to Canaan. After many, many years, his servant came here and said that he had been blessed. And what did he come for? To marry. That was how your auntie, Rebecca, went there. And since she went, we haven't heard anything about her. So that was the way it was then. But today things are different. You pick up your phone, you call US. In a minute, you cut off immediately, call UK, and you're talking to somebody in UK. It wasn't like that. So to Rachel, Abraham and Auntie Rebecca, we are like lost uncle and auntie. That doesn't happen again today. We live in what is called information age. You keep nothing secret now. Our trustee, Uncle Paul, died. The daughter, one of the daughters lives in Scotland. She just came back from work, turned on her phone or whatever, or tablet. Somebody had pasted Uncle Paul's demise on Facebook. This girl who never had anything Look at you now, looking at a photograph and reading that your father in Africa is dead. And that was when she started yelling and calling Kate and yelling and yelling and yelling. It was not like that in the days of Rachel. So there are families you can never say no to. My counsel to you tonight is don't spoil the name of your family. The Bible said a good name is better than silver and gold. Abraham's family had a good history. So the devil Rachel knew was better than the one. This devil may even be old. It's better than the one she didn't know at all. So I'm sure these were the reasons why this young girl agreed to marry an old man. By the same token, there are some families you can't allow your son or your daughter to get married to. That family is mentioned, and your eyes turn red. And at the end, your son or your daughter is saying, I'm going. You say, I wash my hand off. Is that true? It happens here. So don't quote your family 
with many evil features. It seemed Jacob never believed that Uncle Laban would allow the young daughter to marry him, an old man. We hope this message has inspired you. Thank you for watching. To other for this message, please call 080 God bless you.